Habla, you're muted. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't recommend to do an international movie during a pandemic, certainly. <laughs> everybody can imagine. Yeah. What's Made tough? it out eventually. We went from more confined to less confined. Yeah. But Germany was less confined than France. Ah, so it yeah. How it felt a relief to move from the strong confinement to the less confined. That's good. Yeah. Is, is, your, is your lab operational yet, or is it? Uh... <laughs> oh, oh God, no, no, no. <laughs> so there, are, of course, everything was delayed because of Corona, so the refurbishment and all the stuff is still ongoing. And there was a crazy thing about the lack of sinks because since now washing their hands is something that is mandatory everywhere. There were no sinks anymore. So it was like a, the, the stock broke. There was no no anymore sinks. So that. We're gonna work without without a sink because we don't comply with the we wouldn't comply with the regulations, so we have to wait for a sink. That's crazy. <laughs> Seems like a good thing to fix, though. Like even in normal times, you want to have a sink. True. <laughs> I have I have at home too. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know this thing with the hospitals and all, then just ran out of sinks. The kind of answers you will get only in Corona's time, right? That's crazy. So you were moving into a, like a new lab space that wasn't built already. So it was um, it was built, but it was refurbished because before it was used as a small, half office, half lab, and now it has to be only a wet lab. So we had to yeah refurbish <laughs> and made it from new from new right? from scratch. Okay. Hence, not and enough. Put all the things I need that I, they were not used before, like vacuum lines or stuff like this. It's it takes so much time to to get things remodeled and get the spaces yeah. set up well. Again, I wouldn't recommend to do that in Corona time. <laughs> but there was but no I, chance, right? So then, still, it's exciting. This is low, but then we have to constantly adapt and accept whatever is coming. So. We knew already, I knew that the things I was doing, I didn't expect it to be that much, but yeah, it's, it, it is what it is. It is what it is. That's our, <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, right. Do we want to just wait um, a couple more minutes um, to let the stragglers come in or do we want to start right on time? Wait a minute. Right. Oh my gosh, what? Sorry. It's like your alarm telling you to get up. <laughs> it's literally spam phone calls, but for whatever reason, they ring on my computer, but it's, it's actual spam. So I apologize for that. Okay, maybe before you introduce Ricard, I can just tell everyone that, um, so this is the last seminar for this summer session, so to speak. Um, so there's no seminar next week. And then the week after that, it's Labor Day. So there won't be a seminar then. And then we return in three weeks. So that will be on the one, two, that'll be the 15th of September uh, is the next seminar. Um, and then we've got seminars from there all the way through till uh, beginning of December. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll send an email out with the schedule um, in probably this week, probably in a couple of days. Cool. Okay. So Jennifer, you can take it away. All right. And also I'll mention that we're, um, we're skipping um, the US election day, which is November 3rd, um, in case anyone needs to be in a long line or you know, emotionally coping with the fall of democracy or like whatever ends up happening. So um, we're off that day. Okay. Um, and also, I just want to thank everybody for um, coming and participating in this in the, for the past 16 weeks. It's been a lot of fun. We've had a really great response and great community built up. So thanks to, to everyone who's here. All right. So um, our first speaker is Ricard Alert, who I I asked him the right way to say his last name and I just messed it up. So apologies for that. Um, so Ricard is an HF, 
SP postdoc at the Princeton Center for Theoretical Science. He's worked in soft matter, statistical physics, and cytoskeletal dynamics. Um, and he's now interested in collective behaviors and will be talking um, about topics from topological defects to, it, to in fruiting bodies um, and colonies of migrating bacteria. Uh, take it away, Ricard. All right, thanks. So let me share my screen. And, um, and then I'll do like this. All right, and I think this should be good now, right? Okay, so uh, thank, yeah, thank you very much. I wanted to start by thanking the organizers for putting together this amazing series of seminars, which I have been um, following and learning a lot from them. Um, so thanks, and um, it's a pleasure to have the chance today to tell you about uh, the work that I have been doing in the last couple of years um, at Princeton. And so it's also uh, interesting that all of the talks so far in this seminar series have been about um, the migration, both individual and collective of eukaryotic cells. But it turns out bacteria also migrate, also migrate collectively, and they do super interesting things. And so today I wanted to tell you about an example of migration in bacterial, in bacterial communities. And so uh, what I want to show you is how uh, a very physical thing known as topological defects is related to the biological function of a particular bacterial colony uh, in, in, the, in the way that these bacteria manage to form fruiting bodies. So hopefully I'll be able to explain how these two things are related today. So this was a project that involved both uh, theory and experiments. And so the experiments were done in the lab of Josh Shavitz. They were done by Katie Copenhagen. And I was responsible for the theory together with Ned Wingreen. And so you can check the, the preprint here and the paper um, hopefully will come out soon. So I wanted to start introducing uh, collective migration in bacterial colonies by showing you a movie of two bacterial colonies. Uh, what you see on the left is a colony of a soil bacterium known as Myxococcus chantus, which I will refer to simply as Myxo. And what these bacteria are doing is they are collectively spreading and migrating over the colony on the right, which is a colony of E. coli. And so what's happening is that the Myxo cells are preying over the E. coli colony. They are eating these cells collectively. And in doing so, they are forming several collective phenomena. For example, the ripples that you see here on the right-hand side, and also the emergence of these black spots that you see on the left-hand side. And so today I want to focus on precisely these black spots. And so the first thing that I want to show you is that they are not actually spots, but they are three-dimensional structures, three-dimensional aggregates of bacteria that look like this. And so these are known as fruiting bodies, and each of them contains hundreds of thousands of cells. Um, and it turns out that these fruiting bodies are actually part of the collective life cycle of this bacteria called Myxo. And so uh, let me tell you about this collective lifestyle. Um, it turns out that if you take a few spores of um, this Myxobacteria, they are spherical shaped cells that are metabolically inactive so that they can resist long periods of starvation. And then when nutrients come in, uh, then they will germinate. And they will become rod-shaped cells that will collectively migrate on surfaces and prey over other bacteria, just like in the movie that I showed you. This is what's known as swarming behavior. And then uh, eventually if food runs low, if they starve, they will aggregate into very dense two-dimensional monolayers from which they will grow three-dimensional uh, aggregates known as fruiting bodies, okay? And these were the black spots that you were seeing at the beginning. So the interesting thing is that inside these fruiting bodies, the bacteria will sporulate, will become spores again, will become metabolically inactive again, and they will therefore resist starvation until conditions eventually become better and they can germinate and restart the cycle again. And so uh, today I want to focus about on, on this transition between these two-dimensional uh, cell layers and these three-dimensional aggregates known as fruiting bodies. And so uh, previous work had shown that the way you go from the two-dimensional cell layer to the three-dimensional fruiting body is by growing the fruiting body one layer at a time. 
layer by layer. And so this is what you see in this movie. Hopefully you see that the colony starts with two layers of bacteria. And then eventually as these bacteria starve, you will see that the third layer appears somewhere here. And then also at several other points in the colony. And then eventually also a fourth layer appears. And then other additional layers are added sequentially one on top of the other until eventually you get this massive three-dimensional mounds, which will eventually evolve into uh, fruiting bodies. And so when we saw uh, movies like this, our immediate question is, how do these bacteria uh, manage to form a new cell layer in the first place? And it's striking because these bacteria are not growing. Uh, they are actually starving. The only thing they do is they are very well attached to the substrate and they migrate on it. So how do they manage to build up the stresses to eventually extrude the new cell layer on top and form a fruiting body this way? And so to address this question, our experimental colleagues took very uh, high resolution images of a single layer of mixobacteria. And what they saw is this. So what you see here is the individual rod-shaped cells. They are packed at a very high density. And uh, as a consequence, uh, they align with one another. Right? Whenever you pack rod-shaped objects at such high densities, they naturally align with one another. And they form what we as a physicist uh, would call a, a lick crystal phase, which has orientational order. Now, the interesting thing about this uh, state of matter is that unlike the traditional liquid crystals, it's not passive in the sense that cells are not subject only to thermal fluctuations, but it's active. These cells are migrating actively on the substrate and thereby they are creating these collective flows that you see. And so this is a realization of an active liquid crystal. And specifically, it's a type of liquid crystal that is characterized by uh, an axis of alignment, but has no net direction of motion. And this is because these cells reverse their direction of motion every a few seconds. And as a result, at any point in time, half of the cells are moving one way, but the other half of the cells are moving the opposite way. All right, so overall there's a net axis of alignment, but no net direction of motion. So this is what we would call an active pneumatic liquid crystal. And as in passive pneumatic liquid crystals, uh, there are topological defects in these samples. Uh, and I want to focus on them now because previous work had also shown that sometimes topological defects can play important biological roles in, in biological systems. And so let's take a look at this, at this defect points. So here's a close up view of two topological defects. And uh, what you see on, in, in the color code is actually the angle of cell alignment at each point in space. And what you see is that there are two points, this one here and this one there, where all of the colors meet. And this means that cell alignment at these points is not well defined, right? I cannot define the alignment of this particular point because all of the colors meet here. And so these are what we know as topological defects. And what I want to show you now is that the two topological defects that you see here are actually different from one another. So let's look first at the defect on the left. Um, if we look at the arrangement of cells around it, um, it looks like this. So cells are kind of bending around the defect core on the left, and they are kind of splayed around the defect core on the right. And as a result, this geometrical arrangement of cells has a single axis of symmetry, which is the horizontal axis in this, in this case, okay? Now, if we instead focus on the defect on the right, it has a very different arrangement of cells around it. Um, it has this threefold arrangement of cells that go around the defect core, okay? And as a result, it has three axes of symmetry, not just one. And so uh, a way to quantitatively distinguish these two arrangements is by looking at the quantity known as the topological charge, which is essentially just the winding number of the cell axis of alignment as it goes a full loop around the defect core, okay? Um, so if we compute this winding number for this defect on the left, what we get is a topological charge of plus one half. Whereas if we do it for the defect on the right, what we get is a topological charge of minus one half. And so therefore I will refer to these defects as plus one half defects to these other defects as minus one half defects. And the way I will denote them in images is by using a red dot at the core of the plus one half defect, and then a, a, a segment along their only axis of symmetry. Now, 
uh, for minus one half defects, what I will do is I will use uh, uh, a blue dot this time and three segments along their three axes of symmetry, okay? So what we did next was to take our bacterial colonies and identify and track all of these defects and see what they do. And so here's what we found. Um, this is a movie of the cell colony. You see the defects. And what you see is that uh, pairs of plus and minus one half defects are spontaneously appearing in pairs. Um, they are also being spontaneously annihilated and then generally move with the cell flows. So the additional piece of information that you see here is the color code, which is a measurement of the height field of the cell colony. And so what you see here is uh, darker regions means they are taller, which allows you to visualize cell layers. So for example, here on the bottom, there's a second layer, right? And so by staring at movies like this, what we eventually realized is that some of the defects like this red guy here would eventually give rise to the formation of a new cell layer right at their position. So you can see an example of that here, this red defect eventually, boom, give rise to a new cell layer. And if you look at minus one half defects, the blue guys, you will, you will eventually realize that sometimes they lead to the opening of holes like the ones you see here on the top right corner. Um, so we wanted to look at this more in detail. And so I'll show you now two examples of that. Um, here's an example where a plus one half defect in a matter of just a few minutes gives rise to the formation of a new cell layer. Um, and this is very clearly reported by our measurement of the height field. Now, if we instead look at the minus one half defect, what you see is in the same time scale, it leads to the opening of a hole in the cell colony. And again, this is very clearly reported uh, in the measurement of the height field. Now, the next thing that we did is we wanted to measure what is the probability that a new cell layer or a new hole will form at a given distance of a defect, okay? So here are the, the results. What we saw is that for the formation of new cell layers, it's about a hundred times more likely to find a new cell layer form very, very close to a plus one half defect than far away from it. And far away just means a few microns away from it, okay? Now, conversely, if we look at what happens for new holes, they turn out to appear uh, in, you know, about, it's about a hundred times more likely that they appear close to this time a minus one half defect than far away from that, okay? So the experiments show us that uh, new cell layers preferentially form at plus one half defects, new holes preferentially form at minus one half defects. And so the question now is why? So here's where theory comes in to try to explain these this, uh, observations. And so uh, the theory that we developed is essentially based on treating the cell monolayer as an active liquid crystal. And then uh, the, the, the theory is based on um, imposing a force balance between friction forces here on the left-hand side. They are proportional to the speed V at which cells flow on top of the substrate. And uh, these friction forces are balanced by active forces on the right-hand side. So let me give you some intuition about these active forces. Imagine that there's a region of the colony where cells are aligned along a given axis, which I will denote by N, okay? This is the axis of alignment. Um, now, these cells are moving back and forth all the time, and therefore they are pushing on neighboring cells along the axis of alignment. And so therefore they generate an active stress that is very anisotropic, right? And so this active stress I will write like this, be a stress tensor sigma A that I take to be proportional to a tensor Q, which is known as the pneumatic order parameter tensor that is essentially built by using the director field N, okay? The axis of alignment. Now, uh, how do you get an active force from here? Imagine that you now distort the axis of alignment like this, and now you wonder about what's going on in a fluid element like this. Okay, so now what happens is inside this fluid element, stress is uncompensated. There's more stress on the left than there is on the right. And as a result, there's a net force that points left, right? So these are the active forces that I uh, was using in the force balance, which mathematically can be expressed as given by the divergence of this stress tensor that I constructed. So this is the active force. Now, how about the friction? Um, so the crucial thing here is that it's much easier for one of these bacterial cells to be dragged along its axis of alignment like this, along its long axis, 
than perpendicular to its long axis like that. This is much harder. And so to account for this fact, uh, what we use is a friction coefficient that is not just a single number, but it's a matrix with a part that describes the isotropic component of the friction, and then a part that depends on cell alignment in such a way that we have a parameter epsilon that quantifies the anisotropic character of the friction, okay? So now what we can do is take the arrangement of cells around the particular topological defect and compute the active forces and then solve for the flow field that they generate around the defect. So that's what I'm gonna show you now. Um, here's a, a plus one half defect. What you see in the solid lines is the axis of alignment of cells. And what you see is that the alignment is kind of converging into the defect core. And as a result, there's a net pushing force that points left on the defect core. And so sure enough, when we look at the predicted flow field, uh, what you see is a net flow pointing left, okay? Now, the interesting thing is what happens if you look at the color code in this plot, which stands for the speed of cell motion. What you see is that the speed is actually higher behind the defect core than in front of it. And this is a result of friction anisotropy because what's going on is that cells go into the defect parallel to their alignment like this, so they can go in fast, but then they have to move out of the defect core perpendicular to their alignment like that. And so they move out slow. And so as a result, cells, cells are being accumulated at the defect core and eventually they become extruded and form a new cell layer, okay? So this theory explains why new cell layers preferentially form at plus one half defects. Now, if we play the same game with a minus one half defect, which I remind you are the blue guys that had this threefold uh, structure, um, what we find is that there are three directions along which there's a, an outflow of cells at a high speed. And then there are three other directions along which cells flow into the defect core, but at a low speed. And so as a result, there's a net outflux of cells from minus one half defects. And so cells then become depleted from the core of a minus one half defect, and eventually a hole will open up in the colony at these points, okay? So this theory uh, explains both why uh, new cell layers tend to form at plus one half defects and why holes tend to open at minus one half defects. And when we had these predictions, we predicted these flow fields. We then went back to our experimental colleagues and said, you know, could, could you test these in experiments? Could you verify whether we got the flow fields right and therefore our explanation is, is correct? And so uh, sure enough, Katie did that. She measured the flow fields around many, many such defects in the cell colony. And after averaging these measurements altogether, what she found is this uh, flow fields. And so what you see is that indeed in the experiments, we observe a high speed inflow of cells into plus one half defects and a low speed outflux. So there's a net accumulation of cells at plus one half defects. And indeed, we also confirm experimentally that there's these three directions along which cells um, flow out and fast from minus one half defects. And there are these other three directions along which they come in, but overall there's a net outflux from minus one half defects, which confirms our, our predictions, okay? So uh, that's all what I wanted to say today. Uh, let me just summarize what I said by uh, saying that what we found is that very physical quantities such as the orientational order of cells in a colony and the associated topological defects, points where the order is lost, uh, combined with active stresses and anisotropic friction allow us to explain how these colonies manage to build up the stresses that allow them to form new cell layers. And this is a very nice example, in my opinion, of how uh, you know, the biophysics and the active matter principles that govern the behavior of these colonies are related to the biological function of the colony in the sense that uh, these this colonies exploit these principles and the forces that they build around topological defects to respond to starvation, right, to adapt to changes in the external environment by building up these fruiting bodies layer by layer and eventually sporulating and being becoming resistant to starvation, okay? Um, so that's all. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'm very much looking forward to your questions. Thanks.
Great. Thank you. That was really, really, really interesting. I just want to say on a personal note, you know, I've certainly come across some of this um, nomadic stuff before, but I feel like my understanding just went through leaps and bounds today watching this presentation. So I really appreciate it. Um, I just had a, a question of my own before we jump into the audience, which is um, how how, if at all, would this be changed by um, any cell-cell adhesions? I assume that the bacteria only have, you know, steric interactions with each other, but is there a fundamental change in the behavior that you'd expect with the addition of cell-cell interactions? Right, good, good question. So uh, we see very, let, very little cell-cell adhesion, and this we see, for example, by looking at uh, the correlation length of the flow field we see that the, the flow field is correlated over very, very short lengths, which is somehow telling us that there's very little cell-cell adhesion. Um, and I guess that one thing that would happen is we would see much longer correlation lengths than the one, like the ones people see in epithelial monolayers, for example, if cell-cell adhesion would be more substantial. Right, but in epithelial monolayers, the, you do see um, at the, um, plus one half defects, you do see extrusion, right? That's the same, sort of the same phenomenon, apoptotic yes. extrusion generally. Right, that's right. So the phenomenon is similar, but the, the mechanism is, is different in different systems. So for example, in there were monolayers of uh, neuroprogenitor cells, if I remember correctly, uh, where the mechanism was essentially very similar to ours. But if you look at um, MDCK monolayers, then in that case, the mechanism was very different in the sense that what happened is that there was an overpressure at plus one half defects, and this overpressure would trigger uh, cell apoptosis. And only after triggering apoptosis, cells would then become extruded. I see, which versus in your case, it's much more directly physical as opposed to exactly. evoking biological processes. Exactly, in our case, there's not much regulation. It's just simple physical compression of cells that leads to extrusion and cells are still living when they are extruded and form a perfectly living second layer and, and so on. Awesome, thank you. Okay, maybe we can try and get through a couple of questions. There's a bunch of questions we're not gonna have time for, but we can try to do a few. So um, right. Claire, that's right. <laughs> uh, Claire Waterman has asked, um, are these mixo ecologically or medically important? What do they do in the real world? Right, so they are, they are soil bacteria and they do not infect humans. They just live their happy life in, in soil. You can find them in the woods. In fact, I can show you again this picture. Um, was, this picture is just taken with a macro objective uh, in the woods. You just find these little um, yellow spots in the woods. You take a macro objective and you get, get this picture. These are almost macroscopic objects. And so as far as I know, they have no clinical importance, but they are a very nice model for collective behaviors because these bacteria do not communicate over long distances. They do not secrete any signal. They can sense at long distances. The only thing they do is they run on substrates and they bump into each other. And so they're the perfect system for physics-like collective behavior studies. Okay, great. Um, and another from, from Claire, just how much division and growth is going on? Right, so all what I showed you is, uh, is essentially happening in a few hours and these bacteria divide over tens of hours. So growth is not very important in any, any of the things that I showed you. It's all driven by migration. Okay, for the purposes of time, I think we'll end it there, but there's a bunch of questions which maybe you can address in the chat if that's okay, Ricardo. Sure. I'll be cool. happy to do that. Great. And we can, also, um, we can also have a chat sort of um, afterwards for any folks who want to stay on. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Cool. Thanks very much. Okay, our second speaker today is uh, Pablo Saez. Uh, Pablo did his undergrad and PhD in Chile studying how membrane channels contribute to cell communication. Uh, calcium signaling and cell migration. Uh, he then did postdocs at the Institute Curie with uh, Anna Maria Lennon and Mathieu Piel, and is now a, a new group leader and a professor at the University Medical Center Hamburg Eppendorf, interested in how cells communicate with each other during migration. And he's going to be talking about uh, signal integration during leukocyte chemotaxis in complex environments. Okay, well, thanks, Adam, for the introduction. I hope you can see the screen uh, just fine. Uh, 
We're not seeing anything from our end. No, nothing yet. Exactly. Obviously not. Maybe now. Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Okay. So thanks, Adam, for the introduction and, and Jen and Becky for the organization of this uh, amazing uh, webinar series. We have been enjoying it uh, all the time. And as Dan Cohen said, said last week, it was the Zoom meeting we were looking forward to. Uh, well, I don't need to introduce to this community that cell-to-cell -cell communication and cell migration are critical phenomena for life. We are interested specifically in the immune response because these cells need to communicate between each other in a very specific manner, and they also need to migrate long distances. The outcome of the coordination between cell migration and cell, and cell communication will determine the outcome of the immune response. And these cells do this quite nicely despite the complexity of the environment and the specific of the response. They just, just find, they know who to find and where. So we use this, um, we use immune cells as the model to study cell migration because it's extremely efficient capacity to um, control their migration and also communication. So we study specifically dendritic cells because they play a central role in health and disease. They belong to the innate immune system. They are tissue resident. They are rather spare in the tissue patrolling in, in, searching for, in search of danger signals. However, upon danger detection, these cells will have to migrate from wherever they are to the next lymph nodes. And that has to be at the right time, at the right place. Otherwise, as I said, there will be an, a wrong outcome of the immune response, either delayed or overreacting and so on. So the study of this immune cell migration it's nice to do it in immune cells because they have in very different flavors. Some of them are in the blood vessels, some of them are tissue resonant as the really cells. However, despite I really like this scheme by this uh, very talented uh, uh, scientific illustrator that I recommend you to follow, the real life is quite complex. As I showed you before, the tissue is much more complex than that. Therefore, we have found a surrogate model to mimic some properties of the tissue. And this was started more than a decade ago by, the, by several teams, including uh, my former bosses, Ana Maria uh, Lennon and Matthew Piel, but also Daniel Irimia, Michael Six, Robert Nielsen, and many others that use microfluidics. So microfluidics allow us to mimic certain properties of the tissue um, that will uh, allow us to study in a controlled manner how the cells are responding to, for example, confinement, here the cells are just as much, or to analyze the speed when we use these uh, long mic straight microchannels. If we zoom in, we can analyze the cell structure. In this case, we, we can see the, some organelles there, or we can analyze the cell signaling, as in this case, this T cell migrating, you can see the calcium signaling inside. And also we can try to mimic some of the deformation that the cells will face when they undergo migration within the tissue. So what I will show you today uh, was mainly done at the, at the Curie in these two labs, uh, the Curie and IPDG. And I want to already acknowledge all the people that helped me and share many years with them uh, doing this, having a lot of fun and doing all this science, specifically to the bosses. So to Ana Maria, who brought me to Europe, uh, to Mathieu, who, who brought me to the next level of, of microfluidic knowledge. And the catalyzer of this was uh, another Pablo, which is an independent researcher in Matthew's lab. And he was the one who brought me to work with him and his team at the lab of, in, in the lab of Matthew. But everything started uh, in Chile, where I was working before, which by the way, is at the end of the world. Um, and we have amazing places. <laughs> I cannot avoid to take the chance to show you the crazy things we have. We have a flowering desert, the Easter Island, many more in the Patagonia. And it's so thin that you can have a snowboard in the morning and surfing in the afternoon, whatever. In Chile, in the laboratory of Juan Carlos Saez, which by the way, is not my father, not my relative, it's just a coincidence. And he was a study cell communication. He studied a particular family of proteins named connexins that allow direct cell communication between cells that are adjacent and they form what is called gavianchian channels, but they also can communicate the cytoplasm 
in the cytosol with the extracellular milieu by exchanging uh, some nutrients, for example, or signaling molecules. Mm -hmm. At the time, a PhD in his lab found that migratory dendritic cells, here labeling it red, increased the expression of connexin 43, one of the members of this family of, of proteins, when there was muscle injury. So only the migratory dendritic cells that reached the lymph node were overexpressing uh, connexin 43. I agree with you that this is not light sheet microscopy at the time, this is more than a decade ago, but this led us to think that the, this family of proteins, connexins, might be playing a role during cell migration, which was already somehow described in other cells, especially during collective cell migration by the role of gap junctions. More or less at the same time, there was another protein, a new family of protein that was discovered, which is uh, similar to connexins and inexins that we talked already some weeks ago, and the name was panexin. Same idea, they also allow the, the, the exchange of uh, mole small molecules between the cytoplasm and the extracellular milieu. And my function at the time was to check whether this protein could play a role in the calcium signaling and of course, uh, in the cell migration of immune cells. The answer is yes. So to make a long story short, and what I will share with you today is that we unveil how this protein Panexin 1 and p 7 contributed to the calcium toolkit during the dendritic cell migration. And also um, another lysosomal calcium channel that was a study in parallel in the lab of Ana Maria that also plays a role. So we have two different models um, that we use to activate dendritic cells. One is the stranger model. So the cells are activated by a pathogen associated molecular pattern, namely a bacterial molecule, or the danger model in which the cells are activated by uh, ATP, for example, or things that the cells will release up upon trauma. And this, we, we, we split it, we have two stories how which, in which we show uh, how, this cell, how the cells are activated. So the, question, the key question at, in Ana Maria's lab was how leukocytes migrate upon activation. We knew that the cells were migrating uh, randomly under resting conditions, patrolling the, the tissue, but then uh, what happens when they encounter these danger signals? So trying to mimic what will happen in the tissue, we expose the cells to a short ATP pool. So the cells were treated with ATP, then the ATP was washed, and the cells were put to migrate in the microchannels. And we observed that the panexin one that is activated after uh, uh, ATP receptor, namely P2X7, uh, this, this ATP treatment increased the speed of migration in the wild type cells. However, panexin-1 knockout dendritic cells were unable to speed up. As you can see here, the uh, spontaneous speed of migration, the resting speed of migration is very similar. So there is no intrinsic defect of these cells uh, under resting condition. Therefore, they are unable to speed up. And this is what you can see in the video. So the cells migrate just fine on the knockout and their resting condition. But then when we treat the cells with ATP, the wild types are able to accelerate, speed up, but the panexin ones are unable to speed up. We eventually found find out that this was, of course, calcium dependent, and somehow that finished increasing the, the, the speed of migration. But it was not quite clear what was the role of the panexin one there, because we find out that the panexin was not allowing direct permeation of calcium, but rather was the calcium inflow was via P2X7. So then what was the role of panexin-1 there? It's been described that panexin, at the time it was described that panexin-1 uh, released ATP, allowed the permission of ATP. So we thought maybe there is ATP-induced ATP release, which was the case. And we use an, uh, an ectoenzyme uh, named apparatus that degrades the possible ATP that will be released via panexin-1. And when we do that, we observe that the treatment with apparatus completely abolished the increase in speed induced by ATP, suggesting that the initial ATP pool induced further ATP release, and that sort of sustained the signaling while the cells are speeding. We then show that the, this ATP release was actually there. So we treated the cells with ATP, we did the, the wash out, and then we, we observed that the wild types release ATP and the panexin one knockout dendritic cells fail to release this ATP. If the prediction is correct that the 
for example, one is a low in ATP release, what is missing in these cells that are unable to speed up is some more extracellular ATP released by the same cell. Since the cells do not have this membrane channel, they are unable to release it. So the prediction is that if, we, if these cells will find the ATP outside, they will be able to speed up because their intrinsic motility capacity was not affected. And actually, that's what happens. Instead of doing a pulse of ATP, now the ATP is in continuum. And now you can see that the finexin knockout diabetic cells are able to speed up just fine, like the water type. Then we were looking for the mechanism. So we, we also showed that this was dependent on CAM kinase 2. And we were lacking of the link between this calcium signaling and the increase in the speed. So we didn't look too much because we went directly to the cytoskeleton and we analyzed what happened in um, life act dendritic cells. So these cells express uh, life act and allow the actin dynamic visualization. More or less at the same years, uh, the, the, the Pablo Vargas, he developed in conjunction with uh, Paolo Pierogon and Matthew Morgan uh, at the QD uh, a method the acting behavior in cell population. So what they did is to do image sequence. So we just acquire images of cells migrating in the microchannels like this one. And we do size normalization and alignment. And then we generate an average cell that sort of reflects the average behavior of this cell along the migration on the microchannel. Then we take several cells and we average and generating this population of average that reflects how the acting was behaving in most of the cells, uh, in the majority of the cells in a cell population. So we find out that the wild type cells have more acting up to, up to three dependent at the cell front, but upon ATP treatment, there is an appearance of acting to the cell at the cell rear. And actually the quantification shows that the acting spend less time at the front and sort of goes to the back, which is here the inhibition of every single step of the signaling I, I show you prevented this relocalization of acting to the back and the acting was retained at the cell front. And as the quantification shows here, there was no reduction in the time that the, the acting spent at the cell front. So then we showed here that the ATP initial pulse activates the ATP receptor P2X7, which opens the panexin one channel and generate this autocrine feedback loop. This uh, is followed by a subsequent calcium influx that activates CAM kinase 2, and that allows the, re the relocalization of acting to the cell rear and, and the cells increase the speed. As I said, in parallel, we had this other branch of the, the activation of immune cells, which was LPNs. And uh, Marine Bretou, a postdoc in the lab of Ana Maria, and the, Follow the project that I started, Pablo, and, and they were analyzing the role of this lysosomal channel named TRPML1. So this mucolipin one channel was interesting for them because the processing of the information that the dendritic cell needs to carry from the periphery to the lymph node occurs in the lysosome. And they find out that the TRPML1 knockout dendritic cells were not accelerated to the same extent than the wild type. So Again, the lack of this uh, calcium channel, which is the mucolipin one, was preventing the cells to migrate efficiently as they were supposed to. Interestingly, the lysosomes were located at the cell rear, where there's actin patches you can see here around them. And this sort of led the way to, to think that the lysosomes are acting in a very local manner, so probably releasing calcium locally. And then this later on increasing the cell speed. But how these two very different signalings can converge? Because if we activate specifically these channels, namely TRPML1 or p 2 7 we get two completely different profiles in the calcium signaling. You can see here that MLSA1, a TRPML1 agonist, induces a very small increase in the site of solid calcium just in the vicinity of the lysosome. On the other hand, ATP induced this biphasic calcium increase at first a spike followed by a sustained increase. Despite this signaling is completely different, both uh, agonists 
uh, manage to increase the cell speed in the breeding cells migrating in this microchannel. So where was the convergence? And again, we didn't have to think a lot because we were already all working in, 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 the, in the cytoskeleton. And we find out that these two signals, the L LPA associated to a pathogen and ATP associated to cell damage, they both increase the speed by inducing a relocalization of the actin from the cell rear, from the cell front, sorry, to the cell rear. So we find out that the actin reorganization was a conserved mechanism used by these cells to undergo fast migration. But as put nicely in this recent review by, by Jörg Renkowitz and his team, the complexity of the microenvironment is much more than the, than the 1D that we use in the microchannels, right? Uh, then we, the question was, is the same signaling working when the, comp, the tissue become more complex? Of course, we went to analyze right away to the right of the, the axis to, to, in this case, collagen, which is a, it's a cellular matrix. So here you can see wild type dendritic cells stimulated with ATP and then watch out, so ATP pools, and then the knockout dendritic cells. And as you can see, the color that uh, reveals the track of the cells, so where the cell has been, is much longer in the wild type than in the panexin one. So with this, we show that the, the spontaneous migration was slow and non-persistent, and then up upon ATP treatment, the cells become fast to persistent. This you can see in this quantification in which the cell displacement was significantly increased in the wild type, but it was not increasing in the panexin one knockout and the cells. The final question for the immunologist was, is this true in vivo, right? So what we did was to inject these cells labeled with different colors in the footpath of the mice. So we put them in a ratio almost 50-50 um, in the same place. So that the cells are in a mixture. So they will arrive to the same place and the same tissue at the same time, both treated already with ATP. So the same protocol. And what we observed was that the annexin one knockout dendritic cells, again, failed to arrive as, as much as the wild type, the lymph node uh, 16 hours after. So what I show you in the microchannels predicts very well what happens in the 3D and also in the tissue in vivo uh, in this experiment. In the next year, some other collaborators and colleagues have been increasing and tackling different questions uh, on the signaling. So for example, the role of this uh, ectonucleotide, uh, ecto, ectoativase um, that contribute, show that this feedback and the, this response also contribute to tumor rejection. Um, recent paper showing that this uh, loop probably plays a role in, in brain trauma. And of course, the partner proteins, not the panexins, but the connexins has been shown. It's a long time that they do play a role in, in collective uh, migration by communicating the cells. And again, there is an autocrine purinergic loop uh, as shown recently by the Friedel's lab. So we were happy. We showed that the cells all, are, all in all the system show this defect uh, when they lack of this polynergic signaling that prevented this uh, autocrine loop. And we had this signaling as the, as the outcome. So this is the scheme that sums up all, all the previous um, data I just showed you. So there is ATP that stimulates the receptor, there is an autocrine loop, and then this eventually increases the cell speed. But the big question is how were these cells interacting with the microenvironment because the cells are not migrating alone. And then the next step also is the chemotaxis towards the lymphatic vessel. So here you can see that the cells are after the random migration, they undergo directional migration to reach the lymph nodes where they eventually after reach uh, the lymphatic vessel, sorry, that then eventually reach the lymph node. So in, in, in the motile scheme, the question was how the cells integrate the chemical signal, so the, 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 the chemokine, and the physical cues of the microenvironment, namely the obstacles that cells are undergoing. But also another question that I had was how the cells are interacting with each other and also with the tissue at the same time while they are migrating. 
So to do to study this during chemotaxis, um, we develop a, a new device, another microfluidic device that allows the visualization of the cells undergoing chemotaxis in 3D. So here you can see that the, we generate a gradient and then the cells are following the gradient only in the place where the chemokine in this case is. Uh, and in this zone that is far from the chemokine, there is no gradient and the cells keep on moving randomly. If we zoom in, we can see that the cells are doing, doing branching and following quite well the, the gradient despite the complexity of the environment. But can these cells interact if they are all migrating at the same time? to the same place. So as you can see here, these enriched cells are, at the moment they detect the chemical and they start migrating. And the question was, can these cells interact? Maybe not physically, but releasing things. So we know that cell communication is much more than what I have shown you. So there is exosomes, small molecule release, receptor, receptor, and of course the, the mechanisms I, I show you. But as has been, quite nicely said in this, same, in this very same webinar series. Sometimes it's better not to try to tackle all the biological mechanisms, but rather to make a model that might help you to predict uh, what is actually happening. And this is what we did in collaboration with another group in the Curie and also in the Sapienza University in Rome, asking the question, do these single migratory cells are coordinated coordinated as a group, sort of like bird flocks. So the standard model to test this maximum entropy model they developed uh, was wound healing migration. So we know that these cells are interacting via cell cell contact and using different mechanisms, which were not relevant for the model, but just to test whether there was interaction or not. And here you can see that there is interaction, so close to one is interaction. And then as long as the analysis is going far, this is zero, this is the border, it's sorry, but sorry, but it's reversed. And then as long as you get away from the border, this interaction decreases, which makes sense because what the cells that are very far in the monolayer, they are interacting, but not in a productive manner following the axis of migration. So then Elena Agliari, uh, she uh, took the data I produced in the dendritic cells and I split it in, in, in two regions. So analyze what happened in this region that the cells move randomly. And in this second region where the cells move directionally. And what she found is that the, there is no interaction actually. There is, you can see here in both zones, zone one in red and zone two in purple, there is, it's very noisy. So there is no relation of the interaction to the place where the cells are going. And in another figure of the paper that I encourage you to, to, read, to read it, and there is no interaction. But this interaction was tested as if it was in instantaneous interaction. So what this model shows is that there is no instantaneous interaction between these cells during cell migration. But what about the delay effect? So this was very difficult for, for Elena and Michele and Adriano to put in the model. I cannot explain you why, but it was very difficult for them to put the, this spatial temporal variable that what happened uh, with a delay, which is something that we would expect. Something like the cells are releasing, I don't know, microsomes or releasing molecules that will be sensed by the cell afterward. So this is still an opening question. And if anybody in the audience uh, is interested in, in having a discussion about it, I would be more than happy to have it after the seminar. Okay, then we had, as I said, at, in the model team, the, the team of Pablo, he had this very large question. How do immune cells react to the changes in the microbiome? So the cells are migrating efficiently, they follow the chemokine, and they don't get lost despite the complexity of the environment. And recently has been shown by Renkowitz at the sixth lab that different collagen density uh, sort of uh, propel the cells to, to migrate. So the cells will avoid this higher collagen density because it's more dense, so it's more obstacles. So the cells, if they can, they will avoid it as you can see here in the video. So most of the cells will try to escape and they will follow on the side. But what if the cells cannot escape the border? 
that this was one one big question here the cells are they they have the chance to escape and they choose to escape most of them they choose to escape this uh, very dense collagen but what if they there is no chance so the typical model of chemotaxis is that when the cells are getting closer to the gradient they accelerate and this was shown already in the lytic cells in the collagen by, in, in a paper in 2016 by, by Biogras. And you can see here that the cells, as long as they are approaching the gradient, they speed up. This is the classical canonical model. Using our chamber, uh, we observe the same. So this is uh, a, what we call loose collagen. And as long as the cells approach from the zone one, where they are random, to zone two, where they start to fill the chemogram to zone three, they speed up. And this was expected. But when now we use a collagen that is more concentrated, so now we use a more dense collagen, now the cells were first slower and second, which was expected, but not able to speed up. And that was a surprising result. And we, we sort of did it several times and we always find it. So why could this be? So then I did this imaging following uh, the cell morphology and at the same time, the, the nucleus. And we, we saw that sometimes the speed of the cell was not following the speed of the nucleus. Something like the nucleus sometimes was sort of stuck in a place and sometimes the cell was moving elsewhere and the nucleus reposition, something that has been uh, shown very nicely in this bifurcation system by, by Renkerwitz. So to, again, to analyze this, uh, we developed a model. In this case, it was Ido Labi who developed a model based on this, on my data. In this case, you see this is aptotaxis migration. That means that the chemokine binds the fibers of collagen, so binds and unbind in the batch, and sort of generates a gradient in this zone. It doesn't penetrate more. And that is aptotaxis. So the cells are detecting both soluble chemokine and also chemokine that is attached uh, to the collagen fibers. So he uh, reproduced this um, in the, and of course the video is different. I will show you, there's, they are flipped. Here you will see, apologize for that. You will see the arrival of the chemokine and then it generates the migration only in this zone. So sorry, but the videos are flipped. So this is aptotaxis in the raw data and this is the aptotaxis in the, in the model. Then he did the same. For the chemotaxis, that in this case is another chemokine that doesn't bind the collagen, so it's purely soluble. And then you can see here the cells might follow the, the, the gradient, and here the same in, in the model. So what he introduced, he, he called them traps. So then he had two kinds of traps, so soft traps and hard traps. And the soft traps will let the cell to be stuck for a shorter period of time, and the hard traps, they will make it for a longer. So he compared what happens in the random condition, in the directional migration without trapping, so no traps at all, and then directional plus traps, as you can see here. And what Ido had found is that the number of traps is not really the number of events or the percentage of events, it's not really increasing a lot, but what increases is the time the cells are spending in this flow. And there is a very nice example how they have explained this, this trapping effect. In so imagine you, if you have a, a rope, a ball with a rope in a forest of obstacles. And if you pull the rope softly, then the ball will jiggle around and they will move and follow the rope. But if you pull very strongly, in, which will mimic what happens when the chemokine is there, the ball, instead of moving around the obstacle, it will get trapped immediately. And that's what we think is happening. So I put that the article is in preparation because it is, and I have more, to you, more data to show you about. But I really want to say that the, if this article is in preparation, it's thanks, thanking, it's thanks to Ido uh, and Asta, especially also to Bianca, but especially to Ido and, and, and Asta that are analyzing and producing more data. So we thought there is two ways of getting trapped. One is the branching, and one other one is the nucleus. So first we put the cells to migrate in this forest of pillars. We put the chemokine and then you see the cells have this sort of lamellipode and there is no obstacles here. The cell can just move between the, the, the forest of pillars. And then as long as the cells approach the gradient, there is an increase in the speed as expected. 
But what now if the cell have to face bifurcations? So now the cells are in a, in a maze, in a hexagonal maze. And now the cells will have to face uh, bifurcation and decision making every time there is one obstacle. Now, when the cells are facing this uh, branching, now the cells are unable to speed up. Suggesting that branching or extreme branching, as you can see here, is contributing to the, to the trapping. We, we thought this could be the case and actually is because here there is no more nuclear confinement. The nucleus is equally confined all along the maze. The only thing that changes is that the cells on the right side here is that it's facing bifurcation, facing bifurcation and branching. What about the nucleus now? We were expecting also the nucleus to contribute, and this is the case. So now we did a force of pillar where there is no branching, uh, no nuclear confinement, and then just a small dense force of small pillars in which the nucleus will be deformed if the cell goes through. You can see that it, initially the cells avoid to go through because there is no need, but as long as they, they sense, as soon as they sense the, the chemokine, they are forced to go, and now they undergo this extreme deformation of the nuclei when they are, and then again, they are trapped. So we measured the speed and the directionality, and then you can see here, if we divide this in four zones, one, two, three, four, then you see the directionality is almost the same. In, in all of them, the cells are undergoing that migration to the right, where the chemokine is. And then if we analyze the speed now, instead of following the same, they follow the same direction, but instead of speeding up, they are trapped, as you can see here, very well in the zoom, the, the nucleus is very well deformed when the cells is going through, through these obstacles. So we define this trapping effect as the addition of the branching and the nuclear deformation. And this cell in the collagen shows very well that. So you see this cell is falling in a trap, probably due to the nucleus. There is no uh, DAPI imaging here, but you can more or less predict where the nucleus is. And then the cell is falling in a trap, takes some time, it resolves it, and then it pushes the nucleus forward, and then it ends up falls in another trap, and the same happens. The cell in the bottom here is doing a lot of branching, but it's resolving them, resolving the branches quite quickly. Until at some point, by the very end of the video, it does too many branches, and now again, this is stuck. So we define the trapping effect as the sum of the branching plus the nuclear deformation. So now I am approaching uh, more or less the, the, the end of the talk, and I want to talk to you a little bit more about migration, but in this case, human migration. So this is my migration, and I moved from Paris to Hamburg recently, where I'm starting my own group. Uh, so this is the city. We are hosted at the UKA, uh, the Hamburg uh, Medical Research Center, and at the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Cell Biology. And my team actually only have met once because of Corona, all the interviews and all were via Zoom, of course. But we'll be starting soon. soon. And this is my team. I'm, I'm very happy to, to, to show you that we're already almost ready to start. Uh, and if anyone is interested in doing a rotation of coming to the lab, please uh, drop me a message. What we will do in what I call the cell communication and migration lab, because I guess you notice already that I am interested in, in these both phenomena, is work a little bit more in the calcium signaling during the migration in 3D. So we have observed, I show you already that there is two different sources of calcium during the different stimuli. So if the stimuli is ATP, so a danger associated molecular pattern, the extracellular calcium is playing a role. So it's calcium influx via p 2 xrf When the cells are stimulated with NPS, now the calcium is coming from intercellular source, from the lysosome. So what happens in 3D? Uh, during chemotaxis, and then this is what I show you here, the speed of migration is not affected in the short term by chelation of the extracellular calcium, but it is impacted when we chelate the intracellular calcium or inhibit PLC, which is part of the signal of the receptor of the chemokine that I use in this case. This shows that the calcium uh, that is necessary for migration in 3D and to undergo directional migration is the intracellular and not the extracellular one. And this you can see here in this couple of videos. You see this is the control. The cells are following the gradient to the right. These cells are treated with Bapta IM, and now they follow the gradient just fine, but they do very slowly, as you can see here. So they follow the gradient. There is no 
much problems in directionality, but rather in a speed of migration, as this graph shows. So we aim to study, the, the idea will be to study as much as we can of the different components of this messy calcium toolkit, which I, I already showed you before. There are a lot of uh, molecules that contribute to it, and we will be studying much more of this. But one key thing is to zoom in and look at the cells. We have been doing that already in, in, in Matthew's lab and Pablo's team. And we have observed already the branches, the nuclear deformation. You have observed how the actin behaves. But what about the calcium? Of course, that is another <laughs> level of complexity. And everybody, everyone that has worked in calcium imaging knows that this is a tricky, a tricky point. But this is something I really, really would like to develop in, in the team. And this now imaging of the calcium, as you can see here, during the 3D migration. Of course, the, the time resolution has to be very fast. Um, and in 3D, it's not easy, but we still already managed to get some data. And you can see that the, the cell is migrating to the right, as always, the camera is to the right. And you can see that the, there is much more activities in the calcium signal in the front than at the back, which was already known and uh, named many years ago as the calcium paradox, but there is more calcium at the back, probably helping for the actomyosin contractility. And then there is these small changes in the front that suggest the possibility of uh, microdomains or nanodomains. What else we will do? We will do, of course, uh, cell communication, and then we have see different models. Especially you like this one, um, the wound healing or the, the 2D migration, either on top of a surface or wound healing straight over to the point. Because then here we have cells with very stereotypical shape, but then we have the, the leader cells that they are showing very interesting phenotypes. And I would like to really study what happens with the ER in those cells. And of course, then come back and do the same in the, in the 3D migration. So just before finishing, I would like to, to discuss a little bit with you about uh, virtual conference. So this has been a very weird year, a crappy year, let's say. Um, and before that, with a bunch of colleagues, we were discussing about how to improve conferences because we normally we don't think about it, but many people cannot decide which meeting that they attend because they don't have the visa for it. It's not that only they don't have the money, but also they, they cannot get a visa for that. Probably doesn't happen to many of the people of the community, but actually happened to many scientists. And virtual conference are breaking this problem. So we were proposing to have more virtual meetings. People were looking at us like, mm, maybe it's not possible. And then Corona came and well, now you see. And as an example of how good these virtual conferences are, and still the in-person meetings, they should exist, but then the virtual conference allow have very rich communities, like just like this one. So this we have had so much fun in all these months, uh, having such a diversity and such a rich community presenting their data. Uh, that really proves the point. Having this virtual conference has gathered the community and keep us all together in this very challenging time, but especially without making any difference. It doesn't matter where people were, as long as they have internet, they could access to it and share or get the knowledge that we are producing. And if you see the, the, the channel of these webinars is, is just great. And so in just before I, I finish, um, I would like to, to, we have been clapping each other and celebrating each other uh, presentations for a long time already. This started already in May, but we haven't done, I would say properly, uh, to thank the really the people that started this. So then I would like to uh, thank in the name of the whole community. And I hope everybody can do and open the mic and clap and acknowledge to the organizers. So that is uh, Adam, uh, Jen, and Becky, because uh, it's thanks to them that we are been enjoying these uh, nice webinar seminars for, for such a long time. So with that, I would like to, to, to thank them and, and a long list of people I would like to, to thank and, and you for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions.
And thank you, Pablo. <laughs> thank you. That, that was unexpected, but um, really, really appreciated. So thanks for that. Thank you so much. And we, yeah, we and I guess me and Jen and Becky would like to say thank you to all of the speakers who have participated in the last 16 weeks and um, everyone that's attended uh, and been catching up on YouTube and so on. We really appreciate it. Cool. Yeah, so let's um, let's go ahead and dive into uh, questions. Uh, back to the science, which we're all more comfortable with than this feeling stuff. Uh, but I I had a, a question. I think this is just from my own ignorance. But um, you know, when you talk about these dendritic cells in these in vitro experiments, and you see an increase of migration of maybe like twofold or something like that, can you give me a sense of what that actually means for the in vivo situation and 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 how to how to connect that when I think about you know what's what's the immune immune response actually doing you know in that's, vivo? that's a very good question Jen. So what we, what I can tell you is that for the in vivo I will I will answer it in a different way. We know that the dendritic cells lacking this panexin one protein they were not able to speed up. So they, they didn't reach this three micron, four micron increase in the speed. That traduced, translated to what happens in vivo. It means that after 16 hours, there was a bunch of them, the, the half of the, the, the panexin one knockout inhibitor. So probably the smaller difference we can see in the, the microchannels, they are amplified then in the tissue. So I would say that the proportion is not, it's not arithmetic, for sure it is not. And it depends probably in, every, in different cases. I, I checked, I did like the kinetic in the in vivo and the panexin uh, one dendritic cells eventually arrived just that 24 or 48 hours after. Maybe that at that time is not longer required. So that is the problem of the immune response that the timing is really specific and it's really a major, cons major constraint. If you don't arrive at the right time, then it's a mess. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And then just to follow up on that, are there any known like human diseases that are caused by, by these kinds of mutations? Well, there are some uh, immunopathies there. So there is a, a big bunch of diseases that are not well described. Mm -hmm. And some of them are related to migration, but this is a high, hardly unexplored field. And, but it's a very, yeah, it's a very good point. That, that is a very unexplored field, yeah. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Maybe we can do a couple of questions then. I've got also a couple of questions, so I'll come back to me in a sec. Uh, so we can start with uh, Tim Pesenden. He says, hi, Pablo, do you think um, dendritic cells regulate cytoskeletal genes like DIA1 and ARP23 components by changing their expression or by post-translational regulation? And if it's by expression, what transcriptional regulators allow uh, dendritic cells to shift their cytoskeleton for faster or slower migration? Yeah, about the transcription or regulation, I, I wouldn't, I couldn't answer it. And even less to Tim that is much more expert than me in the field. But I can tell you that the, the, there was a change in the, um, the so from R to three at the front, the cells downregulated its function and it started to be more MDL one at the cell rear, so formats. How are they regulated on time? So there is another protein that. Uh, is named ARPIN that could be playing a role. There is some, some data on, on that that I, 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 I can't really tell you much because I was not directly involved, but there is some hints that they could be more, I would say that it's more um, a relocalization regulation because the changes is quite fast, but they should be also be accompanied by the change in the expression because there is sort of a fast increase, but then it's a, with a slow kinetic, there is a, another increase, so then, Probably there is also trans, uh, translational regulation about the uh, post translational modifications that I, I couldn't tell you at all. Maybe we can we can discuss about this after. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, C. Chang asks: With so many branches in dendritic cells, how do they determine migration direction in three D? Is it random? Is there competition among the branches? That is an excellent question. So we have. I have another. I had another project that is still uh, well, everything delayed by Corona, but still on the way to be finished. In which we are exactly addressing that question: How is that the cell decided which branch is the one that is going to win? Is it random? Is it because it's phased or an obstacle, or there is something intracellular that is determining this? And we found already uh, that 
the cytoskeleton, microtubule cytoskeleton plays a major role. So there is a recent paper by the SIDS lab that also shows uh, how the microtubules control the migration in the dendritic cells specifically. And in the treaty, we are addressing that specific question. What is that it makes the cell to decide for one branch and not the other? Thanks. Uh, maybe there's a question from me. So in those experiments you did with the chemotaxis and haptotaxis, do you see any differences between the results between those two? So it's, does the cell just need to sense the ligand anywhere it is, whether it's immobilized or soluble? There are differences, yes, because also the gradients are not the same. So the question is, can we actually compare the two indistinguishably? I don't think so, because the gradient in one is static and it changes very little on time. The other one is moving. So it's a big wave of chemokin coming and flowing. And then at some point in the video, you see that the cells that first sense, so the cells that are in the region that first sense the chemokin, now they are not undergoing any more chemotaxis because there was there is enough chemokin there accumulated, so there is no more gradient. So I am I'm not really sure that we can interchange the, the observation between the two. So, but I can tell you that the, the speed of migration, for example, changes very similarly. The cell shape is also very, very similar. So the, the, the way that they face the branching is very similar. Um, what else I can tell you? The, we have already observed that in both cases, there is this trapping effect. So then when the, there is a trap, it gets stuck. So it's not related to the signal, but rather to the, to the environment. So if there is an obstacle and the cell is getting stuck in there, it will be stuck whatever the signal is. And it's going to get stuck irrespective of the cue. It's just about, about more the speed that the cue exactly. is pulling on, like to use your analogy. If there was another signal that we could try that is not a chemokine, for example, that would be lovely to try whether there is also this effect. Because as you said, it's, it's probably irrespective of the signal, but rather related to the microenvironment complexity. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, I guess people are really interested in branches. Here's another um, branch question. Uh, so um, from Anne, she says, IDCs have more branches than MDCs, and do they struggle more in the trap device? So the thing is that the, the immature, this is a tricky question because true, there is more producers because there is up to three, but then the cells are not mature, so they do not express the receptor that led them to go um, to follow the chemo guide. So then we know already that when the cells get mature, they, they get shorter. They have a reduced micropinocytic capacity. So they uptake less uh, of the extracellular milieu. Um, so then the, the point will be to find a chemokine that will work for immature dendritic cells. There are some that works very well in vivo but not in our hands yet in our system. So in our system, everything is done in mature dendritic cells. And for the moment, we cannot answer with data for the immature ones because they do not follow the chemokines that work in our hands in the in vitro system. But if any, but to answer in a side way, if any cell had more branches, they should get more trapped, whatever the reason. If it is an immature or a phenotype that they have more branches, they should get more trapped. That is the prediction of the moment. Thanks. Uh, got a couple more questions here. So um, Ankita Ja asks uh, that she may miss it, but are the ATP channels involved in maintaining front rear polarity in the cells? It looks like they do because of the redistribution of actin. And are these channels localized, so are the channels localized in the cell front? Um, and if so, is it known how that's regulated? Very good question. So that, that I think is the, the channels that are involved are cell, cell specific, but also stage specific. Some of the channels might be playing a role in immature dendritic cells or in random migration, some others under chemotaxic. So this is one thing. So then of course, when you go into the calcium signaling field and the ion channels is already a gigantic confusion because every possible channel will play a role. How is the question? In neutrophils, for example, has been shown that there is a nice relocalization of the receptors for the purinergic signaling that occurs in these cells. So the ATP receptors and the cell, the enzymes that degrade ATP, they nicely local, relocalize to the front. And some of these proteins, and some of these ion channels too. Um, in these cells, 
unexpectedly, we didn't find any relocalization of panexin 1 or P2F7. I was really hoping and expecting to see a nice accumulation at the cell front, but it was not. I didn't show the data, it's in, it's in the paper, but there is no relocalization of this. The only thing we analyzed, at, at least in our paper, is that there was this acting relocalization, but the receptor was not relocalized and the panexin 1 channel was not relocalized. That doesn't mean that it's more functional at the front. Sorry, Jan. No, no. Um, are you all set? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to, to interrupt you there. Um, so I think this will be our last question in case um, if anyone else wants to, to jump in. Uh, Rafael Petrosan uh, says, thank you for a very interesting talk. When cells are passing through many confinements, is there overexpression of some proteins, some specific proteins in response wow. to that? How, how we wish to know that. Yeah, that would, there is a, there's a $1 million mm -hmm. question. Which are the proteins that are overexpressed when the cells are facing constantly challenging? The Matthews lab have already showed that they, when the cells go through obstacles several times, the, nuclear, the nucleus breaks and there is DNA damage. So that would be ultimately in some cells that undergo so many nuclear breakage will finish with the cell death can be the other way, that the cells get a positive signal and not a dead signal. That could be, we don't know that. That is an excellent question. And we have already discussed many times in, the, in, the, in both labs, in Ana Maria's lab and Matthew's lab, which are the molecules that are upregulated or changing when the cells are facing constant obstacles in different kinds. Yeah. One more question. Hopefully we'll not keep you, Pablo, thanks. Uh, from Ana Pastera. Pasapera, excuse me. Um, she may have missed this, but inside the body, from where is the extracellular ATP coming from and how is it released? And is oh, okay. the nucleotide, like, sorry, and is the nucleotide metabolized or degraded to ADP or AMP, making other purinergic receptors respond to these metabolites? Yeah, this probably I didn't explain a lot, but the ADP was released by the same cells. So then is mitochondrial produce ATP probably. There was no relocalization of mitochondria, at least in the essays we, we did. But anyway, there was ATP induced ATP release. So were the same cells which release the ATP. Maybe that was not really clear. Then of course this ATP will be degraded. And then the other nucleotides will, will have an effect on the on the migration. However, when I tried them. Uh, separately, so I tried ADP, AMP, adenosine, there was no increase in the speed. There was no synergy with ATP, and none of them pre prevented the ATP effect. So probably for the signaling, the ATP released by the cells, or either applied in continuum, so ATP released after the ATP pulse, or when applied in continuous, the ATP is dominant over the other signal. How is that? It was very surprising because initially when I started the project, I was expecting not the P2X7 receptor to be play a role, but rather the receptor that have a higher affinity and they need small amount of ATP to be activated. The P2X7 is a weird receptor because it needs large amounts of ATP to get activated. But when I did the concentration, uh, so I tried all the possible <laughs> concentrations and only those that activated P2X7 induced the increase in speed. Then I did the pharmacology that also is in the paper. And then I tried all the inhibitors, the classic inhibitors for the different ADP receptors and only again P2X7 was. One of the answer to the reviewers was about the adenosine because it will get accumulated and it is accumulated, but then adenosine was not inhibiting the increase of migration induced by ATP. So we don't know yet what the different nucleotides are doing. And this is one of the main focus of the, the research program that brought me to Hamburg, uh, this center of excellence that is study exactly adenine nucleotides in inflammation. Okay, awesome. Um, that was really great. Thank you both so much, um, Ricard and Pablo. Those are really fantastic talks and um, a great way to, to end the series for the summer. So we will be back on September 15th and hopefully everyone will be rejuvenated and, and ready to go um, for- And a... if anyone needs to catch up on uh, 
someone else they've missed they're all on the youtube channel so please do that awesome thank you so much everybody i'm gonna stop the youtube live stream so you guys thanks ricard and thanks pablo for the lovely send off there that was really nice